Okay, and we are live tonight. Welcome, everyone. My name is Tamar Wiener. I am the co-founder of Women Who Lift Israel. I am so excited to have everyone with me here tonight. No matter where you guys are watching, we have a really awesome, special interview today planned for all of you with Kalanit Tab. Uh, as I said, I'm a co-founder of Women Who Lift Israel. We are a female-only community. We focus on empowering women through all forms of strength training. And we are always trying to find more female role models, inspirational, motivational women to share their stories with our viewers. So today we have a very special episode because today we have our community nominated special feature, Kalanit Tab, who was nominated by our community of over a thousand badass women. So Kalanit, first of all, Mazel Tov on being our special feature, and thank you for being with me here tonight. Gladly, it's fun. Amazing, and I'd like you to go right away. I want to jump right in. I don't want to waste any time at all. I want to get to know you. So please go ahead and tell me about yourself, introduce yourself, and anything you'd like us to know about you. Um, so I'm originally from Cleveland, Ohio, Cleveland Heights. Um, I moved to Israel when I was 18 years old, which is almost 17 years ago. Um, I'm from a very science oriented family. My mother's a physical therapist. My father's a cardiologist. My uncle's a doctor. My aunt's a doctor. My grandmother a, was a pharmacist. My great grandfather was a pharmacist. So it's like growing up like Shabbos table talk. Like, I don't know what other families was considered normal, but for us, it was like, oh, let's discuss this medical journal. Let's discuss this new research study. <laughs> yeah. So like for me growing up, like I knew science was something that I wanted to do because for me, that was just natural and fun. But as a kid, it just made me squeamish and I couldn't handle like I'm like oh the idea of blood or oh the idea of seeing something disgusting like I remember like my parents medical textbooks I would like open up the pictures <gasps> I want to see that <laughs> they just bothered me so yeah so like I knew I wanted something science oriented but not medical but um yeah so um I ended up studying computational chemistry at Mohontal which when you think about it I studied chemistry for my bachelor's. My father studied biochemistry for his bachelor's before going to medical school. My grandmother and grandfather, grandmother and great grandfather also studied chemistry for their um, bachelor's before going on to pharmacy school. So I'm like a fourth generation studying chemistry for their, uh, for their bachelor's. Um, I've been working in pharmaceutical development for eight years already. Um, if I had to describe myself in one, like, who am I? It's like, I'm someone who's always moving. I'm always doing. I'm not someone who could just like, oh, let's just sit down and do nothing for the next couple of days. That's not me at all. Not one bit whatsoever. Like, I've always volunteered at all different things. Even as a teenager, like I volunteered at a theater as an usher, or I volunteered um, visiting my neighbor once every once a week, or like an older, funny story, I would visit my neighbor once a week and I ended up marrying her great nephew. <laughs> yes, but um, nowadays, like even like when I think I, for me sitting home and doing nothing is not who I am, like so, often as people think of like Shabbos afternoon as sitting down and relaxing time. So for me, Shabbos afternoon is like sitting down and playing board games with the family. It's not like, for me, my relaxing is doing. So like, I think we have about 20, maybe 30 different board games that we play. And yeah, if you need advice on board games, I'm a very good person to ask. <laughs> Amazing. So then uh, I absolutely love this because I love all the different like, pieces and traditions of your family. And I love the board game stuff. We were just like that. So I absolutely can connect with everything that you just said. And what I want to go into really, when we start to talk about your story, let's talk about young Kalanit, because we're talking about the board games in the family. This is a perfect segue. So what was young Kalanit like? 
actually Young Colony was not into board games. <laughs> not Ooh. at all. But like I was a very, I guess you could say stereotypical geek, but in a good way. I don't know. Like I think they're all good, but like I see it as a, a good type of geek. Um, I don't, not that there are bad geeks, but, but I, <laughs> so like for me, I remember I would come to the library, I would check out about 20 or 30 science fiction fantasy books, come home, read them all, come back four days later. I need more books. Oh, you didn't like them? Oh, I read them all. I want the next ones. So I would just like, I remember I read through the like entire fantasy section in the young adults. So by the time I was like 12 or 13, I was reading like adult fantasy books and adult science fiction books. And I just absolutely loved reading I, I don't I don't think I can even count the amount of books I have read in my life um I also used to um like play baseball as um an extracurricular activity that I liked I liked ice skating um I would bike ride everywhere um because like Cleveland Heights for people who don't know it is a very open area so if like okay I want to go to my best example is um, when I was 16, I volunteered at a zebrafish laboratory at Case Western Reserve University. And it was in the middle of the day. So I would leave school at 12 o'clock, get on my bike and bike ride about five or six miles to the campus. And then I would volunteer at the lab and then I'd bike ride home. But yeah, <laughs> that's, and then, um, and then I came to Israel. <laughs> it wasn't young colony anymore. Amazing. And so after you came to Israel, was that then when you were in, uh, introduced to CrossFit? No, not at all. So like I said, I've only been in Israel. Um, I've been in Israel 17 years. I only started CrossFit about three years ago. And it's oh, like, wow. yeah, like it's like not something I ever thought I'd see myself doing, but now that I'm doing it, I can't ever see myself not doing it. <laughs> it's like, it, it's now it's a very big part of who I am and how I identify myself and what I enjoy. And it's so much fun. <laughs> I love it. What I, what I love the most about your explanation right there is first of all, how big your smile got. Like, I don't know if you realize that, but <laughs> Right when you uh, started talking about CrossFit, I mean, you've been smiling all this time. You're a smiley person. However, yes. the moment we brought that up, you were just from wall to wall smile. And I love that. Because it's um, fun. It is so much fun. <laughs> I love it so much. Yes. And I love your passion for it. And I really want to get into the details of the story of how you got started. But before we go into that, um, you are very outspoken about a condition called hyperemesis gravidarum, um, also referred to as HG. Um, we recently, uh, not recently actually, it was a couple months ago, interviewed Efrat Lev, who is a power lifter who also suffered from HG and my three neighbor. times, and your neighbor, um, yes. and she even mentioned you during her interview as part of her support system um, and an advocate for women who suffer from HG. So um, we've had Eflat on the show explain uh, what HG is uh, generally to our members. Um, and so we want to know more about HG and how it affected your life. Um, not just, of course, physically as a physical condition during pregnancy, but also, you know, mentally, emotionally, all the different aspects. And then of course, what is it that made you so passionate about wanting to advocate for its awareness? Um, so like I've said before, I'm a very active person. I like always doing, I like always being active. And um, <laughs> it's like hard to think about it. But when I was like, at the time, it's like when I realized I had HT, I remember I was um, simple things like not eating and not drinking. Anything you try to eat, anything you try to drink, nothing stays down. And simple things like sitting in a chair, like 
let me ask you a simple question. Can you sit in a chair for five minutes? Yes. <laughs> that seems like a very obvious, easy answer. But like when you are completely dehydrated, completely starved, sitting on a chair is just impossible. So to, to imagine going from being someone who um, is always loving to do things and always loving to like be doing something to like just something like sitting simply in a chair. I remember I would be sitting in a chair and I couldn't do it anymore. And I just lie down on the floor because it was just too physically exhausting to sit in a chair. Like I, I wasn't willing to accept at first that I couldn't do anything. So I just continued pushing myself and then I'd get someplace and I'd be like lying on the floor because I couldn't sit up anymore. And one of the things that made it so I guess you could say difficult for me was um, I'd, I'd heard that nausea and vomiting during pregnancy were normal, was normal. And I'm like, okay, so I'm having a normal pregnancy. But it, but I didn't know anyone. I had n no one I knew like, and I have, I have a lot of friends and I know a lot of people and nobody I knew had ever had hyperemesis. So like, it didn't make sense to me what was going on. And I felt completely and totally alone by it. And um, it was extremely traumatizing because like um, my first HD pregnancy wasn't nearly as bad as my second. Um, my first one was controlled with medication and with medication I managed, but my second pregnancy, even with the medication, it just, like a skeleton of a person. Like I was not functional. I was not able to do anything. And I went from being super mom because that's what I like being to being someone who's not even able to care for herself. Um, I remember I hit like to the doctor's office because <laughs> I didn't have a car at the time. And I ended up at the doctor's office and lying out and fainting in the entrance of the doctor's office, being sent to the hospital by ambulance being sent home two days later, only to go back to the hospital three days later and um, spent about three weeks in the hospital. Um, and even once I was home, I was regularly going in to get IV fluids at the local urgent care center. And it just, I was, it was like, it was very difficult emotionally, that feeling of what is going on with me I don't understand why I am the way I am. I don't understand why it's so bad for me. Like, but everybody gets pregnancy nausea. So why is it so bad for me? Why am I not? It was, it was very, very isolating because as someone who's used to going out, I'm not able to go out. And I just felt completely alone. And I remember after I gave birth, I was extremely traumatized by the pregnancy and I would I would spend a lot of my time at the local park and that's where I met Efrat Lev like I think when my daughter was about five weeks old I was just like I know for me talking about things I went through is very healing so I would go to the park every day and I was just telling every single mother I could find or father or grandmother or aunt or uncle or sister brother about what my pregnancy was like and how I managed it and then Efrat came and she's I'm like he's like oh you're the person in Efrat who had HG my husband her husband's an anesthesiologist so he came one time when they called an ambulance for me I'd heard about you but because of um, doctor patient confidentiality things her husband never told her who I was which I don't mind at all I completely understand it as an EMT myself I never tell anyone who it is the patient that I see and um, I ended up going to therapy for close to a year afterwards because it was just that mentally and emotionally difficult for me. And like during that time, I felt that I didn't want to be isolated. So I was like trying constantly, like in every like mother forum or every like Facebook group that was for mothers or pregnancy, I'm like looking for other people who had hyperemesis to like not feel alone. 
And then I ended up opening up a Facebook group called Hyperemesis in Israel to like find a place to gather all those people that I found with Hyperemesis. And um, and I, I kept like thinking to myself, like, what could I have done differently during my pregnancy? And I kept on like opening up research articles and reading about this treatment option or what can be the negative outcome. And I was just like, PubMed is amazing. <laughs> like I was just reading so many research studies after research studies about hyperemesis. And I learned so much that way. Um, and there's this amazing organization called Beyond Morning Sickness that the author wrote a book about her um, experience and they sent me a copy of the book and I like read it cover to cover <laughs> completely. And they also helped put me in touch with other women who had hyperemesis. And um, also we're able to like, I'm like, oh, by the way, do you know what a good research study is for hyperemesis with correlation to Helicobacter pylori? And then they'd send me the research study and then I'd research, read yeah. up on that some more. Um, I've actually ended up flying overseas twice to go to medical conferences about hyperemesis. And part of the reason what led to that is I remember like, for me, like, I guess you could say the turning point in my therapy, like that one moment that I felt like I'm a, like on the other side, I guess you could say, was when my therapist looked at me and she goes like, you seem to me the type of person that gets better by learning as much as you can about something. And I'm like, that is so true. That's me. And I'm like, I will continue trying to learn as much as I can, which is why five years ago, I flew to Norway for a medical conference on hyperemesis. And a year ago, I flew to Amsterdam for a medical conference on hyperemesis. And about two years ago, I participated in a medical conference in Laniado on hyperemesis. It's like the more I learn, the more it's just easier, but also the more I can help others and have them not feel alone in what they're going through. Because like the hardest thing is like you ask a simple question like, I don't know, is it normal for your throat to burn after you throw up? And like if you don't have anyone to ask, it's just so isolating. But the minute you have like 12 other women who say to you, oh, that happened to me, or even have 200 women or a thousand women, it's just so like reaffirming and realizing that you're not alone. And something that could have been traumatic is not traumatic because you have a community where you can discuss it. Absolutely. And I think that's a perfect answer. And really, um, first of all, we have the same goals for both of our groups is to have a community for women by women. And that yeah. women often have legitimate questions that you can't just shout from your, your window <laughs> and ask just anyone. Um, and that we really deserve to have a safe place that we can ask everything we need to ask um go ahead no nah, just it's completely true what you're saying it's like it's true for a lot of people in all different aspects that when you have a community that supports you it's a lot easier to deal with trauma versus when you feel isolated that i find at least for me that that trauma can be a lot more traumatic Yes, um, I definitely agree with that. And the other part that I wanted to add, only because I remember this from my interview with Efrat, um, which to this day, by the way, is one of my favorite interviews that I've had so far. Is Efrat amazing? Um, right? Because she's totally amazing. Um, shout out Efrat. Um, uh, but what I was going to say is something that she said that really struck me because it was simply not something that had ever really crossed my mind was everyone talks about um, depression after pregnancy. No one talks about during pregnancy and trauma that you experience during pregnancy and how that can really feel. Um, and like you said, it feels so isolating to not have someone to turn to that has experienced something similar that can, that can be there for you. Yep, yeah, like something like I can add to it. Like I spoke just now about my first two pregnancies. I have three kids. Like after my second pregnancy, I created a community for myself of other women with hyperemesis. I learned an incredible amount about hyperemesis, which also led to learning a lot about 
health in general, pregnancy, all the all other medical aspects. Because sometimes in order to understand B, you need to understand A beforehand. And during my third pregnancy, I would actually say the hyperemesis in my third pregnancy was worse than my second pregnancy. But my third pregnancy was a million times easier than my second pregnancy. Because things like when I got dehydrated, I didn't wait until I couldn't pick myself up for the floor to go to the doctor and get IV fluids. I would immediately proactively seek care. When something was upsetting me, I would turn to my community and have someone who to talk to immediately. And because I was proactive in getting care, I was hospitalized at six weeks, which seems incredibly early, but I was already getting IV fluids for a week already every day from five weeks pregnant. And I was getting help quickly. And therefore I was hospitalized early because I, the problem was identified earlier. Um, I ended up having a feeding tube for six, um, for six months at third. Um, I ended up losing 18 kilos from six weeks to 12 weeks. I was losing about three kilos a week weight a week. And for any women out there listening who say that you want to lose weight, hyperemesis is the absolute worst possible way to do it. Don't ever think that it's a good way to lose weight. Because Not recommended. You're a skeleton of a person and the recovery from it is hard. So no, that's not a good way to lose weight at all whatsoever. No, I ended up having an NJ tube putting in nasal jejuna. And I was still losing weight with the nasal jejuna, but instead of going from losing three kilos a week, I was losing like two kilos a month. So much, much better situation. So again, but like also my first, second pregnancy, I was like surviving on IV fluids. And my third pregnancy, I was getting food. And like, oh my gosh, I have energy. I can sit up, I can function. Like, yes, I'm doing worse off because I can't eat or drink anything. So like my second pregnancy, I was only getting IV fluids every two to three days. And then like this time I'm getting food on a regular basis. Okay, I'm not eating it, it's going through a feeding tube. But like things like I can sit up and hug my kids. Like I'm able to do that. And it's just like better care and better advocacy makes for like a better outcome and better emotional response to what you're going through. Absolutely, and I really commend you for everything that you've done, and I think that the work you've done is really amazing. Um, and I know firsthand how hard it is to run, uh, not a, not just a group, but a group of women uh, on Facebook. My group is a lot smaller, because I'm picky about who I let in. It's like, I will only let you in if you are someone who currently has or has had hyperemesis. So there's a gotcha. lot more like, like if like theoretically speaking, if someone's like, um, I want to learn about hyperemesis. I'm like, there's a lot of great resources. I'll help you get to those resources, but we're a small group for women with hyperemesis. Yes. And I think that's a key difference because then that's somewhere that it's not just like, you know, women who might necessarily have opinions about HG but haven't necessarily experienced it. This is a group for women with HG where they can ask other women who have it or have had it. Oh, I completely agree. I will say my opinion on HG before I got pregnant was a horrible, horrible opinion. Like I thought like, okay, this is morning sickness. So if you have morning sickness and you can't function in the morning, just wake up at 3 a.m. so that by the time morning comes around, you're functioning. <laughs> no, totally totally wrong but that's what nope. that's what my original opinion was nope <laughs> terrible opinion <laughs> you quickly learned you quickly learned very very quickly learned that it's absolutely flat out wrong so then I want to ask while we are on the topic only because um, I know that now you not only are a runner, you have run 10Ks, you've run half marathons, you also do CrossFit at CrossFit Gush. Um, yes. I would love to know how you were introduced to CrossFit in the first place. How did it happen? I mean, you went from having HD, which is horrible, 
And you went from that all the way to where you are now. How did you get started? So, um, like I remember how I said earlier about don't lose weight like that. It's not recommended. So I, after my second birth, for example, I had a newborn baby and I had a two-year-old and my two-year-old was a normal two-year-old and would run. And I couldn't catch my two-year-old because I was completely physically out of shape. And then after my third HD pregnancy, I had a five-year-old and a three-year-old and a newborn baby and they acted like normal kids and they'd go to the park and run and chase after the ball and there's a car coming and they're running and you want to catch them and you can't because you're just completely totally out of shape so um a good friend of mine leora elman who also had hg like i said we're a support community that helps each other out um asked me would i want to walk the jerusalem 10k with her so I'm like, okay, I can't run, but I can walk nice and slow. So um, me and Leora and another friend, Wendy, um, we walked the 10K together for the Jerusalem um, for the Jerusalem Marathon. And it was nice. It was sightseeing. And we didn't take, it wasn't hard. We, like, we never felt out of breath at any point because we walked incredibly slow. It's so cool. Like you go through Jerusalem on a bus and such a busy city and suddenly you get to walk through it calmly and relaxing, get to see Jerusalem. You actually got to like stop and see the sights instead of rushing by. And it was fun. And I really enjoyed it. And I'm like, okay, I enjoy this. I'll do it some more. And I ended up, um, uh, walking a couple other races and then um during one race like I remember there was one person like next to me who the entire time was like no you can do it you can run you can run and like she just stayed by me and this was like the Tel Aviv um 10k four years ago exactly and she didn't try to go ahead she's like you can do it like I'd run for like 10 seconds and then I'm like you can do it you can do it and then I'd run again <laughs> I finished that 10K in an hour and 40 minutes, which is a terrible time for walking. Like you can run a 10K, it, you could probably walk a 10K in an hour, 35 minutes, and I'm trying to run, and it took me an hour and 40 minutes. And um, I finished the 10K, and Sarah Gilbert, who's another member of Women Who Lift Israel, uh, and also in CrossFit, and she had done just on the half marathon, and I was like beet red, like a tomato, completely not functional, lying on the ground afterwards. <laughs> and like she gave me rehydration fluid and I drank it. And um, I'm like, okay, if I want to continue doing this, I need to actually get a train and not just like going for walks or trying to run without absolutely no training. Don't do it. I don't recommend it because I hurt my foot and it took me a while to recover because you can't go from nothing to giving it your all in one go, you need to train properly. So um, a friend of mine recommended to me to download the app Couch to 5K. Now the app I downloaded, the first week program is walk five minutes, run one minute, walk a minute and a half, run one minute, walk a minute and a half, like eight repeats of like the walk one minute, run, like, sorry, run one minute, walk a minute and a half, and then five minutes of walking. I couldn't run for a minute, and I did not, I was not able to complete all eight <laughs> things. Like, the first week, the first training, I couldn't do it. It was just too hard. So, like, a lot of people would, I could assume, would be like, okay, um, I can't do it. I guess I'm not going to be able to run someday. So I said, no, <laughs> I wasn't willing to accept that. So I'm like, okay, this interval idea is really good. So how about what if I did run for 20 seconds and walk for, it was like, it was, I think it was like, it was supposed to be run one minute, walk a minute and a half. So I'm like, okay, I'll walk run for 20 seconds and then walk the minute and a half plus 40 seconds. Like, and I was doing it that way. And I think it took me about a month of like doing intervals of like building up slowly until I was able to get to the first week of the Couch to 5K program, <laughs> which most people that's their starting point. But, but the thing that makes 
such a huge difference was the fact that I wasn't willing to accept no for an answer, which is a, something that you can see is a theme that repeats itself around me all the time. Um, and I just continued hard at it, like going out three or four or sometimes five times a week for half an hour, coming back red as a beet, completely out of breath. <laughs> um, but I got better and I slowly got better. And I remember the first race that I actually ran after training, I was still terrible. Um, <laughs> I was. I, it was the Jerusalem Women's 10K Night Run. And I finished it, I think, in an hour and 33 minutes. And I remember I came in last place and BD Deutsch came in first place. <laughs> and I took a picture of her like, we need to have first and last place together. <laughs> and, and you know what I said? I, I remember I was saying to people, I came in last place. And they're, they're looking at me like, you came in last place. Why are you proud of yourself? I'm like, I finished. Finally, last place means you actually finished the race. So I'm super proud of myself because I finished the race. And I worked hard at it. And um, like about a year later, I did the women's life run 12K. And I ran and I injured my ITV, um, the muscle in my thigh. And I couldn't walk for about two or three months because of that. And I went to physical therapy almost immediately. And the physical therapist said to me, um, your problem is like, yes, you've strengthened your calves and you strengthened your shins and your legs have gotten super strong, but your core strength is almost non-existent. <laughs> it's like you, you're basically, um, what should be done with your core strength, you were using your ITB, your muscle in your thigh, and because you were overusing it, because you wasn't using your core strength in your stomach, that's why you injured yourself. So I worked with her for about six months and my core strength slowly, slowly got stronger. And then I was able to start running again. And like, I had to start from the beginning again, but it wasn't as bad a beginning as it was like a year beforehand. And just about the time that the physical therapist said, okay, you're good now, you don't need to come seeing me. Um, if Ratlev, you can see her name, <laughs> repeat itself a couple of times because she's a she's definitely made a difference in my life a lot. She had just posted that she had finished her CrossFit training course. So I came to her and I said, can CrossFit help me strengthen my core strength? And one of the things that Frat said in her interview is like 99% of the people that come to CrossFit come because they want to lose weight. And I immediately responded, not me, because that was not my reason for coming to CrossFit. My reason for coming to CrossFit was I want to strengthen my core so I can go back to running. And um, it definitely strengthened my core. I'm like one of the exercises that is very um, standard and basic in CrossFit is the ab mat, which is pretty much like a sit up, but with a curved um, thing under your back that makes you use your core muscles, engage them more. I guess, and I just remembered that like, okay, the exercise is 50, the, the today's endurance is today's watt is 50 ab mats. And I'm just like, okay, how am I gonna do one? <laughs> and I would just sit there and I would struggle and there would be like sweat pouring down my face as I did one ab mat and the people next to me are doing 10, but they're doing 10 at the time they take me to do one. They're like, go Kali, you can do it, you can do it. And they're encouraging. And it's such a supporting, wonderful community. And I stuck at it and I got better. And I, um, and I, uh, and I, my ab mats got better. And I was within a couple months, I was at the same place and I'm just doing ab mats back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Like, because you practice when you work hard at something, even if you start off with, at rock bottom, working hard helps you get better. Um, yeah, and that just, and, and, and at the same time, I also decided that I wanted to start running my first half marathon. And it's just like, I could see like, it's not like I can't talk about my CrossFit without my running because the two were together. It's like, yes. CrossFit yeah. got, absolutely. My CrossFit got better, made my running got better, made my CrossFit got better, made my running got better. And it's like, they both improved steadily together at the same time. Yeah. 
So <laughs> that's how I started off at CrossFit. That is an amazing story. And what I love, I mean, there were several things I like loved along the way. You were like telling your story and I'm like, oh, I have to say how much I love this part and this part and this part. I mean, first of all, I think it's really, really um, something that I wish I could explain to more people is to focus on what you can do and not Absolutely. So much, right not so much on what you can't do so like what you were talking about is you couldn't even get through the first program in the couch to 5k so did you go home and you said i can't even get through the first one so i'm just not going to do it no you adapted it into a way that you can do it and in a way that works for you and i mm -hmm. think that is a message that i wish more people could get um that is very important it's like, I remember I had a conversation with a friend of mine the other day. She goes, I can't exercise. I have weak ankles. So I just started listing off to her 10 exercises you can do without using your ankles at all, like um, ab mats. <laughs> like I just spoke about them. There's, or um, uh, what's it called? Um, haramot ner. Um, oh, candlesticks. Candlesticks, yes. So you're not using your ankles at all. There's like, just because you have one limitation doesn't mean you can't do anything. And that's very true. Yes, awesome. exactly. And the other part that I really, really loved about it is when you finished the very, as uh, last in the run and you were so proud of yourself. And that is exactly how it should be because it's not about comparing yourself to everybody else, even though that's literally what placement's all about. Who's in first, second, third place, etc. It's not about that. I got last place! Woohoo! You finished. I didn't even run a race you know so like yeah. what it's about is that personal accomplishment and then that goes into the last point that i wanted to make and this is something that is like if i had a megaphone right now i would be using it because this is something that i feel like should be shouted everywhere is the idea of non-scale victories right so everyone looks at fitness and working out and thinking like my goals are losing five kilos or something like that or gaining five kilos or something you know very specific that is scalable and measurable there's also all these non-scale victories running after your kids and being able to catch up to them or running after I mean, a bus and catching the bus Right, exactly. Or like, you know, being able to to walk around and, and, and not feel like you're compensating with your legs somewhere. It's about, you know, looking at yourself today and think I am so much better as a person than I was last week. Um, and I think these non skill victories are hugely important. And I love, love, love that you mentioned that. Gladly. Amazing. So I want to move on to our next question, which is that you are a volunteer EMT. Uh, can you tell us how you first decided to become a volunteer EMT? Um, and what kind of work do you really do on like a weekly basis? So um, you remember how I said I was going to CrossFit regularly and I was training for my first half marathon? That's when I yes. decided to become a volunteer here in ENT. But like, okay, let Amazing. me go back a bit. Um, so when I said earlier that I was a squeamish person, um, in a way that's still true about me. But having dealt with hyperemesis, I learned to deal with it despite being squeamish. And having kids means your kids fall down and they get a bloody nose and you have to clean it up. And just because you're squeamish and things are hard to look at and they doesn't come naturally doesn't mean you can't get used to it. So um, also like having had to call an ambulance way too many times when I was pregnant. <laughs> I got like I was familiar with the concept of volunteer EMTs because I saw them a lot treating me and helping me. And I remember I um, was like starting to make phone calls about, oh, can I um, 
are you opening up an EMT course? And they're like, yes, we are. It's in a different city, far away, three times a week, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, I have my CrossFit. I have my running. I have my running hug that I go to. And um, by the way, forgot to mention, I was also doing Dungeons and Dragons twice, twice a week because I love my geekiness. And just because I'm doing this doesn't mean I can't do that. Working full time, I have three kids. Um, I want to be an EMT. It's interesting. It's something I want to do someday, but I don't have time for it. Like my only free evening of the week is Sunday night and I can't do it now. And um, I don't know if you've heard of Nas Daily. He's a Facebook um, vlogger, but he made a vlog post about um, United Hatzalah. And I commented saying on that post, this reaffirms my goal of someday being a paramedic. Now, at the time, I had no idea what the difference was between a paramedic or an EMT. I had no idea that they were two completely different. They're, they're similar, but they're different levels of education. But I'm like, okay, like I had said it to myself before that I wanna do it someday. And I just commented that, yes, I wanna do it someday. And Wendy, who the person who I'd walked my first 10K with responded, Oh, by the way, you know, there's a EMT course opening up in a frat, two minute walk away from your house in like a three minute walk away from your house in two weeks. I'm like, okay, sounds cool. Sounds interesting, but I don't have any time in life. And I called up the guy in charge of organizing the course and lo and behold, it was Sunday evening once a week with a lot of homework. <laughs> But I had an hour commute to work every day, so I would listen to the audiobook every day driving to and from Nesciona from, from where I live in Efrat, and I would come to class on Sundays. And just because I'm super busy and have a very packed schedule didn't mean I couldn't add something else that I wanted to do <laughs> into my super packed schedule. Um, I, the course lasted about nine months. And then I started my training and um, the training, like I guess you call it field training. And um, I guess you could say one of the things that I found, I don't know if the right word is lacking, but I wish for more of is I felt, I felt I wished for more of like personal one-on-one -on -one instruction. And I didn't have that. So I would just, Drive to Jerusalem. One of the th amazing, amazing things about Efrat is Efrat has a ton of volunteer EMTs. So if you have any medical issues, any emergency medical issues, Efrat is like the best place to be because there are so many amazing people that will help you. But as a trainee, it's not always the best place to be because there are so many other people responding. And as a, a, one of the one of a uh, major um, important part of being an EMT is also to not overwhelm the patient with too many first responders. So because there are so many amazing first responders in a frat, it, you didn't, you couldn't get as many, as much training in a frat. So I would drive to Jerusalem. I would go out, respond to calls. Um, I was, <laughs> I guess you could say definitely from my class, I was the one who responded to the most amount of calls, the facet, because I'm a, go, 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 go person. I would like wake up at 6 a.m. on Friday. No, sorry, what am I talking about? I would go on Thursday night to CrossFit. Then I'd wake up at 5 a.m., go running with Shara, and then at, come home, get dressed, send my kids to Ghan, and then go to Jerusalem to help respond to any calls there were. And I did that, and I would be there, and I'd, um, Hatsala, what it is, it's first responders who respond before the ambulance arrives. So I'd show up at the house, before the ambulance arrives. And most of the time, um, yeah. And, and that, like most of the time we're there until the ambulance crew arrives. And sometimes if the ambulance crew wants helps, we'll help them. And um, one of the things I do now as well is I, in my chapter, I'm now in charge of training new trainees because like the same thing repeats itself for me. Like I am like, okay, the other people from my course I felt like I didn't have like someone one-on-one -on -one explaining to me every single thing. So I'm going to explain it to you every single thing. And I did that. And now, um, now that most of everyone from my course has finished their training program, 
um, I'm helping from other chapters and or new trainees in my chapter. So yeah, I'm still doing that. I did that last night. I was with two trainees in Jerusalem and I responded to calls with them and I explained things. And when you have a one-on-one -on -one person explaining to you like, if this there's this type of call, this is what you do, it's very helpful knowing what to do as part of the training. Incredible. Wow, you do some amazing work. It's I fun. never knew that it's so much was involved and I'm glad that you like it because to, to add something like that to an already busy schedule, you've got to love it. First yes. of all, you have to really enjoy the it. Most amazing thing is about it. Um, when you respond to a call, try to imagine like many scenarios, you'll have person A trying to help person B who's having a medical problem and they have no idea what to do to help person B. Like sometimes there'll be someone um, on the phone guiding them and telling them what to do. But at the same time, they're the adult in charge in the room or even the teenager in charge of the room is spending on who that person who called is. And then when you show up, the look of relief on their face of like, I'm no longer responsible. I'm turning that responsibility over to you. Like that's, worth like everything it is such a good feeling like knowing that like that sigh of relief of that person that they no longer have to be in charge of a medical situation that's completely out of their league and they don't know how to handle it absolutely and i have to say first of all like firsthand as someone meeting you for virtually for the first time thank you for everything that you do Gladly. and for the support that you give to to your community um and uh on the other side of things i want to talk about the support system around you uh can you tell us about your support system who they are and how they help you be the best colony that you can be so, like I said, um, I have an amazing support system from CrossFit. Not, not, not that I went to CrossFit to find the support system, but more that many of my friends were already in CrossFit. <laughs> so it's like it just came naturally that uh, there's so many people in CrossFit who are there to help me. And um, I help them. They help me. We help each other out. Um, also... I have so many friends that I've made via Facebook that are like like family to me. Um, my husband, like, okay, I have to say this about my husband. Like, people are like, how is your husband okay with you going out and doing so much? And like, let me just describe a typical evening. Um, I'll be like, yes, how do you feel about me doing an ambulance trip tomorrow morning? And he looks at me and goes, does that make you happy? And I'm like, yes, so, so do it. <laughs> yes, so, so like that, that's like the best possible support system. It's like, he's always, or, or sometimes he's like, Connie, why aren't you doing anything? I'm like, I don't know what to do. He's like, go, go run, it makes you happy. Go do this, it makes you happy. Like he encourages me sometimes more than I encourage myself. But uh, it's like, we're a balance of each other. Sometimes I'm encouraging and sometimes he's encouraging and that's super helpful. Um, yeah, and I'm, I'm really glad to have that support system. <laughs> that's amazing. And I love the fact that you have your own like personal cheerleader. Totally. <laughs> it's it's so valuable and it's not, um, it's not um, a given. It's like, it's, you have, it's important to appreciate it because like appreciate what you do have in life. Don't think about like what you don't have. Think about what you do have and appreciate it. Amen. Yeah. I absolutely <laughs> love that advice. So then uh, what has been your most memorable moment of success in your athletic career so far? And how has this moment, even to this day, impacted you? Okay, I'm gonna answer, I think the answer that you're least going to expect. <laughs> Go for it. So. Um, you'd think that I'd say, okay, when I ran my half marathon that I finally managed to do it in under two and a half hours. Yes, that was amazing, but no, that wasn't it. Or when I ran the hardest half marathon in Israel and I completed it, no, that wasn't it. Or the first time I deadlifted a hundred kilos, no, that wasn't it. <laughs> it's like, those are all, those are all fun moments, but those weren't like the moment. And I think the best way to describe the moment um, 
a year ago, I was involved in a car accident. Um, I stopped and someone rear-ended me. And after that car accident, I had to deal with severe, I was, I was dealing with severe headaches and severe noise sensitivity and severe dizziness. And like CrossFit wasn't even like on the books or running wasn't even on the books. Um, I just couldn't do it. All I was doing was lying in bed every day, taking painkillers because like basically having a migraine level headache 24 hours a day, every day, nonstop. And it was just incredibly difficult. And for about three months, I didn't do anything but stay in bed. Cause I just, I don't know if you're familiar with those headaches, but have you ever like had those headaches where your head's here and then you move your head there and then you feel like your brain comes with a delay and goes boom inside your head and your head just is exploding. Like that's what it was every time I moved. <laughs> and uh, it was incredibly difficult to function. Um, I went to physical therapy and it got better. It still hasn't gone away a year later. But I remember I went to the physical therapist and about five months after I went to the physical therapist, she said, maybe because of the dizziness, you should see a vestibular physical therapist. And like at the time, I'm like, I'm like, I, I'd gone back to work by then. Um, by the way, my work, I have to say about them, they're incredible. They're amazing. Um, there's still a lot of things I can't do at work since the accident. Things like simple things like bending down and getting things from the bottom shelf or filling the paper inside the printer. I can't do it. But like anytime I ask for help from someone, um, I have the problem of too many people volunteering to help me. <laughs> it's just a really, it's really, I really appreciate it. But it is to go back to the vestibular physical therapist. Like I didn't think that um, CrossFit was an option for me because I was dealing with so much dizziness. And oh, by the way, and I tried going for walks. I'm not even talking about running. I tried going for walks and it would just make my headaches a million times worse. And I couldn't do it. And I kept trying again and again, and I couldn't do it. And I went to the vestibular physical therapist and he's like, um, yeah, you have a point. There's a lot of things at CrossFit you can't do, but that doesn't mean you can't do everything. Do what you can do. And that appointment was, I think, Tuesday morning. And I immediately messaged a friend and I'm like, the vestibular physical therapist said I could come back to CrossFit and do whatever I can do. And instead of doing nothing, she just do what I can do. She goes, I need permission from your doctor. And I messaged my doctor on the Muhadet app. And um, my doctor gave me the permission, um, the letter of permission saying that I could go back to CrossFit. 20 minutes later, I was in the gym <laughs> with the frat teaching. And that for me is like my most success story ever because like something I felt that I thought that I would never be able to do again. Like I was involved in an accident. I'm dealing with constant, horrible headaches. I'm getting dizzy anytime I change position and I'm, and then, but I didn't let that stop me. Instead of saying, I can't do anything, I'm like, I'll do what I can. And I remember the first class, a frat came and she just put a box here and she goes, you're going to stand next to this box. And anytime you're dizzy, you sit down immediately and you pause and you take a break. And I remember we were doing goblet squats with kettlebells. And before the accident, um, I think I was doing goblet squats with kettlebells with 20 kilos or 24 kilos. At that time, I took a four kilo kettlebell. And it was like 20, two, do 20 goblet squats. And I did like two or three, got dizzy, sat down, rested, then got up to two or three, sat down, rested. <laughs> and just like, I did what I can within my abilities. And I've been continuing to go to CrossFit. I've been back at CrossFit for about seven months already. And there still are a lot of things I can't do. Like burpees, don't even talk to me about doing burpees. They make, they make me so dizzy. And like ab mats that I was so proud of myself for succeeding at doing, I can't do ab mats. I just like the idea of moving your head like that, changing position of my head, just 
in, like dizziness. I can't function. It's just really bad. I'm still not able to run. And that's incredibly hard for me because every time I try running, I get bad headaches, but that doesn't stop me. Like I went for a walk this morning at 6 a.m. with my neighbor and I'm like, I'll try to go as fast as I can. Like we tried going fast and then I'm like, okay, my headache's too bad. We need to slow down. And then whatever I could do within my abilities is what I did do. And, um, and it, I'm still nowhere near where I was before the accident. Like, but I'm gotten better and I've learned what my limitations are and I'm constantly trying to push those limitations. <laughs> like just to like, by the way, we started now at 8.30 at seven o'clock, I went to CrossFit. <laughs> And I have, to, I, I think I've mentioned this before that the coaches at CrossFit Gush are amazing, but I'll say it again, that they're amazing. And, um, one of the things my coach had to me do today, he goes, I want you to try doing a Turkish get up without any weights. So are you familiar with what a Turkish get up is? So, um, I went to do the Turkish get up. I, it's basically you lie down on the floor, hold your hand in the air and you try to stand up without changing the height of your hand at all. And I, um, I tried doing it once and I just got so dizzy. I lay down on the floor and couldn't move. He goes, okay, Kalnita, I want you to do it again, but this time I want you to do it 10 times slower. And anytime you start feeling a little bit of dizziness, I want you to stop and pause and don't move. And when the dizziness passes, I want you to try to go up a little bit more. And anytime you get dizzy, you stop and you pause. Like a Turkish get up um, normally takes about, I don't know, 10, 15 seconds to do. I think it took me about five minutes to do that Turkish get up, but I did what I could. And yeah, that for me is like what I like. <laughs> Amazing. I love the fact that your moment of success, of success was something that was really originated from a moment of struggle. It's something that you really struggled with is not having CrossFit as a role in your life. And um, I love the fact I, that I hate to do this, but someone's knocking on my door and not stopping and tell, I just want to tell them it's a terrible time. I'm really sorry. All good. Okay, I'm in the middle of an interview. Do you want to take my keys and move my car? I can't stop right now. I'll, I'll, I'll move it in a minute. I will. I'm just in the middle of an interview. I can't. I'm sorry. All good. All good. It happened. <laughs> So as we were saying, um, I would love to move on to our next question, which is that our community is uh, growing every day. We have over a thousand women in our group, which is something that I'm super, super proud of because we started literally from nothing. Uh, so then half of our women actually, according to our statistics, identify as being completely new to all forms of strength training. So what advice do you have for these women who are just starting out? They might not necessarily know what they want to do yet. What advice do you have for these women out there? Um, that baby steps, do what you can and get better. And if you can't do something, scale it back, make it on your level and improve based on that. It's like, it's like, I, like I've said it a couple times already, like if you can't do something within the normal guidelines, make it easier within your guidelines and just work to get better within what you can do. It's Amen. <laughs> yes. Then what is next for you? What does 2021 have in install for Kalanit? Um, so for right now, like I just said that um, I have a lot of, physical limitations as a result of my accident. And my goal for 2020 is try to, to push those boundaries of the limitations, like things that I can't do. Um, I don't want to take no for an answer and I'm going to try to improve to the best of my ability and try to get better. Um, it, just because something I can't do, I'm going to try to get as good as I can or 
even if I can't get to where I was beforehand, to try to improve within my abilities to improve. Incredible. And I love that, especially because we're always just trying to build better versions of ourselves, no matter what that word better means, whether it means focusing on your physio, focusing on your mobility, focusing on crushing heavy amounts of weight or running a marathon, whatever it is. I'd love to do that, but I can't right now. <laughs> but, no. but maybe someday, like, I don't know, maybe someday, but right, right now. But you're <laughs> Finding the best version of you that you can make for tomorrow. And that's what's the most important. Mm -hmm, for sure. Definitely. Yep. So then to end the interview on a positive note, since we're coming up to the end of our hour, um, I wanted to ask you to give us the last few words from the heart. What is your uh, motto in life? Um, you only get to live each day once. Like, even if it's a terrible day, and even if it's a you try to sit on a clear day and you don't even have the strength to let, sit on the chair and you're just lying on the floor, do what you can to make the day be as good as possible, as enjoyable as possible, because you only get to live that day once. And once that day's gone, that day's gone. And even if you can't make that day enjoyable, make it better. Um, it's like, like I said, you only get to live each day once. So cherish it and enjoy it to the best of your abilities and have as much fun as you can. <laughs> Even if you're dying by burpees. Yes. Oh, I want to do burpees so much. I miss burpees. Oh, get back burpees. to them. Someday. I definitely will. I'm not. I. I, I don't want to take no for an answer. And even though it's been a year since I had since I've last done a burpee, well, sorry, since I've last done a burpee without getting so dizzy I couldn't stand up and was lying on the floor not functioning. Um, I want to be able to do a burpee again. <laughs> like you said, though, you're definitely someone that strikes me that you won't take no for an answer. So yeah. I can see a burpee somewhere in your future without dizziness. I can. Yeah. I can. Even if it takes a really, really, really long time, I'm willing to work to get to that. And um, it's already taken a year. I'm not anywhere close, but I'm still going to try to get there. The fact that you're determined, I think, is really inspiring to get there no matter what it takes or how long it takes. And that even if is. I don't get there, which I don't want to take no for an answer, I'm going to improve. And that's also Absolutely. an important thing. Like, don't set for yourself, like, unreal. You remember you said, like, I have like a numbers goal? And sometimes you don't always get to that number. Just the improving is a goal in and of itself that's incredibly important. Yes, amen. I could not agree with you more. And I feel like that was the perfect little golden nugget at the end of what has been an amazing interview. Um, it has been a truly incredible hour with you, Kalanit. And I'm so, so thankful that you've been on our, on our series with us. And thank you so much. Gladly. I hope you have a great evening. Thank you, you as well. And great evening to anyone who's watching with us. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. The broadcast has ended. Oh, it is? It still says live in the top. Oh, it does? Yep. <laughs>